Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I know many of you are joining us now. I am delighted to welcome you to the fifth of the Mindset Lecture Series um, that is sponsored by the Center for Psychedelic Psychotherapy and Trauma here at Mount Sinai. My name is Rachel Yehuda, and it is my distinct honor to introduce our guest speaker for today, who is Dr. Roland Griffiths. He is a professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Neuroscience at John Hopkins University School of Medicine and is the founding director of the John Hopkins Center on Psychedelic and Consciousness Research. And of course, this is the first academic center to focus on psychedelics and it started everything in this field. Um, it's been very, very successful and we can't wait to hear from you. Dr. Griffith's research has been largely supported by grants from the National Institutes of Health. He's the author of over 400 journal articles and book chapters, and he's been a consultant to the National Institute of Health, uh, to numerous pharmaceutical companies in the development of psychotropic drugs. And he is a member of the expert advisory panel on drug development for the World Health Organization. In uh, 1999, he initiated a research program investigating the effects of classic, psych of classic uh, psychedelic psilocybin that included studies of healthy volunteers. What a pioneer. Um, and from there on, you'll, you'll hear the rest of the story. We're going to leave some time for questions. And we're just actually thrilled to have you here. Thank you so much. OK, well, thank you, Rachel. What a pleasure to be here. And congratulations on the founding of your new Center for Psychedelic Psychotherapy and Trauma Research. So I'm going to talk about uh, our work with psilocybin, a little bit of history, neuropharmacology, and uh, therapeutics. I have uh, much more than I should uh, have to say uh, uh, about this, given the time. And, I'll, and I may move through some of the material quickly. For that, I apologize in advance. Acknowledgements. Most of this work has been supported by uh, private sector uh, groups, and I'm on the board of directors of HEPTER. Uh, research Institute. I'm going to talk to you about our research at Johns Hopkins on psilocybin. And uh, about a year and a half ago now, we established the Hopkins Center for Psychedelic and Consciousness Research with a, a very generous philanthropic uh, grant from uh, uh, a, a number of individuals and the uh, Stephen and Alexandra Cohen Foundation. And I'm really representing a very talented research team. So what I'll present is certainly not uh, my research alone, but a collaborative project about which we're all very excited. Psilocybin is a naturally occurring tryptamine alkaloid, principal psychoactive component of psilocybe genus of mushrooms, which have been used for hundreds if not thousands of years in various cultures. In terms of background, these classic psychedelics are a structurally diverse group of compounds. They bind serotonin 2A receptors and produce this unique profile of changes in thoughts and perceptions and emotions. And examples are, um, include the tryptamines, such as psilocybin, phenethylamines, such as uh, mescaline. Historically, there was a lot of research conducted with these compounds in the 50s and 60s. And then that went dormant for a period of decades because of uh, uh, misunderstanding about the uh, true risk profile involved. Just very quickly, it's a Schedule I compound, not to be considered a drug of addiction because it doesn't produce compulsive drug-seeking behavior. Medical emergencies are rare. Nonetheless, there is and should be concern about adverse effects such as panic reactions and precipitation of enduring psychiatric conditions. Principal site of action is serotonin 2A where they function as agonists or partial agonists. Uh, this is an a, a, a illustration from something out of uh, Ross lab uh, last year uh, showing 
what, what, what they did is they determined the active state structure of the serotonin 2A receptor bound to a prototypic hallucinogen. And this is gonna really accelerate discovery of more selective compounds. So we're understanding how these drugs fit into the pocket and then and, and that'll allow uh, development of new compounds of this sort. Serotonin 2A receptors are, are uh, expressed in key cortical and subcortical structures thought to be relevant to subjective effects, consciousness, if you might, uh, including the cortex, uh, thalamus, clostrum, locus aureus, ventral to tegmental area, and uh, the Raffae system. In terms of biological mechanisms of action, uh, it's currently thought that there's a small subset of uh, serotonin 2A excitatory trigger neurons to initiate this cascade of cellular events, resulting downstream in destabilization of brain networks, and then the subsequent emergence of novel patterns of connectivity, which resolve after the uh, compound's been eliminated. And, and the kind of the working hypothesis here is that in the case of psychiatric disorders, damaged or malfunctioning networks, suboptimally functioning networks uh, can, uh, can subsequently reconnect in better ways, healthy ways. So analogous to resetting a computer system, if you will. And this is a, a now classic uh, illustration from the Imperial Lab just showing brain network communication patterns. This is fMRI or MRI data with different networks shown in different colors under a placebo and then under acute psilocybin conditions. And what's striking here is the interconnectivity within and between networks. And it's not just a random process because the, the width of those lines indicate the weightings of the of uh, connectivity. So something wild is going on in brain uh, in the presence of these compounds. And there, there are a number of approaches to explain these effects. One uh, network function that has gotten a lot of attention is the default mode network with activity that's very substantially decreased acutely by psilocybin and LSD but it's also decreased in long-term meditators, which is interesting. And the default mode network is very often hypothesized to underwrite a, a sense of self, ego, if you will. And, and so that kind of fits with what meditation is about and, and uh, in thoughts about ego dissolution under these classic psychedelics. But, but there are other other uh, hypotheses uh, at work. Um, and one involves the uh, colostrum uh, connectivity. So um, some years ago, Crick uh, of, of DNA fame and Koch, who runs the uh, Allen Brain Institute, uh, emphasized the role of colostrum in as a seat of consciousness because it's highly uh, uh, in, uh, innervated by 5-HT2A uh, uh, neurons that connect across uh, a range of, um, of uh, cortical uh, areas. And, um, and we recently, this is uh, uh, Fred Barrett from our lab, recently showed that uh, psilocybin did indeed alter colostrum uh, connectivity to uh, several uh, classic brain networks, including the frontal parietal task control uh, network, uh, auditory and default mode uh, network. And I think I th think one another point I just want to make is that this is an area of, of, of huge ex exciting research. So there are other neural models that are being proposed and that are generating testable hypotheses. So prominent among these other models, in addition to the colostrum, would be um, uh, the Carhart-Harris-Friston uh, model of relaxed beliefs under psychedelics. And that's uh, proposed to decrease top con 
down control by a default mode network as being uh, as being central to how uh, psychedelics uh, uh, impact uh, um, uh, the the nature of experience, and in particular, they hypothesize the uh, the an important role for precision weighting of uh, of top down um, uh, structures or uh, or uh, um, uh, neural networks uh, uh, responsible for holding certain beliefs. So that's the relaxed beliefs under psychedelics, and then. Volenweider has uh, done a lot of work looking at cortical striatal thalamic cortical loops as being central to these effects. So there's just a lot of exciting stuff going on, explaining, trying to explain kind of acute effects. But then also the big puzzle uh, is, well, but how do you account for enduring effects? And there's precious little work on this, uh, Barrett uh, from our lab again, published something uh, uh, last year on a psilocybin trans a reducing amygdala response to emotional and, and neutral faces. And there've been a just a couple of things looking at uh, enduring uh, network changes or uh, brain responsivity changes, but that's gonna be a very important thing to tie down. And then finally, with respect to biological mechanisms, um, we also have the fact that they're very potent anti-inflammatory agents. And so that could be a mechanism. And then uh, the uh, Olson group from UC Davis published uh, uh, this study and have now published a, a series of studies showing that psychedelics produce structural and functional neuroplastic changes, increasing their neurogenesis, biogenesis, and synaptogenesis mediated through the mTOR and other signaling pathways. So that's a, a huge area of interest. So um, in terms of neuropharmacology, uh, lots going on. It's exciting. There's a lot of work to do. Um, however, for me, the most interesting feature of psychedelics is that they actually do produce these felt to be profound, acute, sometimes enduring alterations in feeling states in consciousness. And I just want to express uh, um, uh, what, uh, what should be our humility in that we're deeply ignorant about the very nature of consciousness. Uh, the hard problem of consciousness, if you will, is an extremely hard problem, uh, the solution to which is not clear uh, and strikes me as a mystical puzzle in and of itself. So what I want to do for the remainder of my time is just run through some of the results that we've gotten. Uh, we initiated our work in uh, 1999. We've completed or have ongoing studies in healthy and experienced, uh, uh, or healthy, naive and experienced volunteers, novice long-term meditators, religious professionals, depressed cancer patients, uh, major depressive disorder, addicted smokers, anorexia, and Alzheimer's we're looking at now. To date, we've studied over 375 participants and over 700 sessions. So I'm gonna just go through some classic results from our healthy participants because it really provides a model for how we um, administer uh, psilocybin and for the types of effects that come out uh, in healthy volunteers as well as symptomatic patient populations. So these studies that we've conducted, a series of them were rigorous double-blind studies. Uh, participants were medically healthy. Most of the, these studies, they were a psychedelic naive, uh, and that was to control for expectancies as best we could. And, and typically our participants meet with our session monitors on several sessions prior to the first session to develop this rapport and trust. And the uh, experimental conditions are designed to minimize expectancy effects. 
So the, our studies are conducted in a comfortable living room like environment. Uh, people come in in the morning, they take a capsule. Uh, they're encouraged to lay on the couch with eye shades on and headphones through which they listen to a program of music. They're in the uh, company of two monitors or guides or sitters, whatever terminology you want to use. But these are not guided sessions per se. The session monitors are there just to provide reassurance uh, to the individual that everything is okay. It, individuals encouraged to go in and explore the nature of whatever happens during the experience. And, uh, and so it's not talk therapy, it's very different. Uh, it's quite different from the MDMA model that, uh, uh, that you're uh, uh, working with and are very familiar with. This shows time course of monitor ratings in a dose effect study of psilocybin, just showing this is over the course of a six hour session, showing very orderly dose and time dependent effects uh, with effects coming on quickly, like at uh, 30 minutes, uh, peaking at uh, two to three hours and then decreasing uh, over the rest of the session. So what happens? Well, not surprisingly, psilocybin produces classic psychedelic effects. So there are perceptual changes, there's greater emotionality, sometimes uh, joy, peacefulness, but also about 30% of the time, fear or anxiety can also come up. Cognitive changes, sense of meaning, suspiciousness. But what really drew my attention in this first study that we ran was that in most volunteers, psilocybin produced large increases on pre-existing questionnaires that have been designed to measure naturally occurring mystical and insightful type experiences. And this shows post-session ratings on our mystical uh, type experience uh, questionnaire showing robust dose-related increases. The features of uh, this questionnaire are probing uh, issues, questions about uh, unity, that's a core feature, that is the interconnectedness of all people and things. Everything is one, everything's connected. Could be, could be experienced as pure consciousness. That's accompanied by a sense of sacredness or reverence or preciousness if you want to secularize it. There's a noetic quality of encountering something of ultimate truth. Um, deeply felt positive mood, transcendence of time and space, and ineffability are also features of this experience. I want to confess to a serious branding error <laughs> we made in calling uh, our questionnaire the mystical experience questionnaire. Um, and, uh, and just want to make a point that should be clear to everybody, but sometimes it's not, that mystical experience is defined uh, by a respondent endorsing a constellation of empirically measured phenomenological dimensions. The measure need not imply supernatural or non-rational levels of explanation. And in fact, it's been variously described uh, over time as conversion experiences or mystical religious peak, transcendental experiences, uh, transforming moments, epiphanies. So uh, in addition to this constellation of changes that we call the mystical experience, there's also uh, increases in ratings in psychological insight. And so we've just recently developed a questionnaire to probe that dimension of these experiences. And we think both this quality of mystical experience and insightful experience is important in uh, therapeutic outcomes. Up to this point, I've just described what happens on the session day or immediately end of the session day when they're doing the ratings. But what's really interesting about this class of compounds is these effects endure and or aspects of these effects, the attributions made to the experiences endure. And now we're looking one month after psilocybin sessions 
where we have about 80% of people saying it was in the top five most personally meaningful experiences of their entire lifetimes. And about 90% endorsing increased sense of well being and positive behavioral change secondary to the experience. And I'm just going to run through uh, the kinds of statements or kinds of questions that people are endorsing positively with large effect sizes in this one study at six months. These are Cohen D's greater than one. Uh, just to give you a flavor of what people are, are attributing to these sessions. So this is increased positive attitudes about self, increased self-confidence and authority, authenticity, playfulness, open-mindedness, self-honesty, ability to tolerate suffering, attitudes about life, appreciation, gratitude, enthusiasm, uh, meaning, richness, joy, optimism, dynamic quality, positive mood changes, increased love, open-heartedness, inner peace, positive emotions, inspirations, decreased anger. Uh, this is positive social effects, uh, increased positive relationships, tolerance towards others, love towards others, empathy, compassion, behavior changes. Uh, these were all healthy volunteers. We didn't have behavioral targets, but uh, examples of behavior changes that people uh, gave are improved social relationships, increased physical self-care activities, increased uh, creative activities or increased spiritual practices. So that's out to a month and six months. Here we are at 14 months. All these, all these effects are, are sustained outward for as, as long as we have looked. I, I believe uh, the NYU group did a five-year follow-up in their cancer study and they're showing continued uh, uh, attributions of this sort. So this is just showing that uh, the red is showing uh, endorsement of increased personal well being at five weeks, and the blue is showing it at 14 weeks. And these are all, these are all volunteer reports. And so one could be suspicious that, <laughs> that they're just making this stuff up. But in fact, that's not the case. In about four studies now, we have had community observer raters. Uh, and rate the participants on dimensions similar to the types of dimensions that they're claiming to have shown improvements on. And these are showing significant uh, positive uh, increases. Okay, I'm gonna now turn to therapeutic application. And, and what I'll do is, uh, is quickly go through uh, cancer, uh, depression and anxiety in cancer uh, patients, major depression, and uh, cigarette smoking. So anxiety and depression in cancer patients is obviously a problem. They develop chronic, clinically significant uh, anxiety and depression syndromes that have significant negative impact on quality of life. We conducted a study, this was our, published in 2016, uh, 51 cancer patients, mean age 56, about half female, their medical uh, prognosis, 65% recurrent or metastatic disease, 35% possible ability of recurrence, various different types of cancers. Here's their uh, DSM-4 skid diagnosis prior to treatment with about 40% showing depressed mood, 30% anxiety, and about 30% mixed anxiety, depression, 51% had prior medication treatment for anxiety or, or depression. Our study design was a randomized double blind crossover design to investigate the acute and sustained effects of a very low placebo light dose of psilocybin one milligram versus the moderately high dose, uh, 22 milligrams for 70 kilogram. And we had blinding conditions that were designed to minimize expectancy bias. Uh, total participation time was about nine months. There were two eight-hour psilocybin sessions separated by about five weeks. So uh, you can see there after screening, people are randomized to two, two different conditions. One, they get the high dose first on the first session, and then subsequently, uh, five weeks later, 
a low dose session, there's a six month follow up, and the other uh, randomized groups got the low dose uh, first and then the high dose. And this really shows the bottom line. This is the uh, HAMD depression score. So um, HAMD, uh, uh, as you may know, uh, um, it, they're uh, a clinician rated measure of uh, depression and, uh, and improvement is defined in the, in the HAMD by a 50% drop in the score from baseline. And so you can see in the orange bar at five weeks after the high dose, we're getting 92% showing clinical uh, significant improvement. And that's sustained uh, to at 80% at six months. That's after a, you know, a single dose. And, and here's remission to normal range. And that would be a score of seven or less on the HAMD, which is considered a normative range. You can see we have 60% at five weeks, 71% at six months. And this shows very similar pattern of results uh, uh, with uh, anxiety, the HAMA anxiety rating. We're getting large increases and in, uh, clinically significant improvement that are sustained uh, at uh, at six months, as well as uh, remission. So what does that show? It, it shows that uh, a single dose of psilocybin uh, can produce very substantial decreases in anxiety and depression in cancer patients that are sustained out to six months. So now turning to treatment of major depression, of course, major depression is a big problem. Uh, about 7% of adults have a major depressive illness and 64% have severe impairment. Most people don't experience complete resolution of symptoms with our classic uh, antidepressants and depression, of course, is associated with, uh, with uh, very significant levels of uh, disability. So our study that was published uh, in, uh, in November in JAMA Psychiatry uh, uh, showed that um, this was a randomized delayed treatment or a waitlist control trial examining the efficacy of two psilocybin sessions. So we had 20 and 30 milligrams per 70 kilogram respectively under these same sorts of psychologically supported conditions. And this shows the, oops, this shows the uh, study design uh, so people are screened, they're randomized to either the immediate treatment condition at the top, <clears throat> where you can see they receive their two psilocybin sessions. And then there are depression assessments one week after that second session and at, at four weeks after that second session. And the delayed group uh, goes into a period of delay. They're assessed at those same time points and then they're crossed over to uh, receive active treatment. 24 participants, mean age 40 years, about 70% female. Duration of illness, 22 years, mean duration of current episode, 24 months. 58% uh, failed one or more medication trials in the current episode. Baseline HAMDs of 23. And this shows in kind of a snapshot, uh, the uh, grid uh, HAMD uh, depression uh, ratings at five and eight weeks uh, into the session with both the immediate treatment and compared to the delayed treatment group. Of note here are, is the, are these defect sizes, just as we showed in the cancer study. Here we have Cohen's D's so, of you know, greater than uh, two and a half or greater, which is just, uh, uh, absurdly large, particularly when you consider antidepressant treatment. This is showing the immediate and delayed groups combined. It just, uh, in effect, shows that the, the delayed group showed uh, equivalent kinds of effects. This is from the quids, um, and this is a, 
uh, volunteer or, or uh, patient rated measure of depression uh, symptoms. And the interesting thing here is, is here we assessed uh, the day after sessions. And so you can see uh, at baseline and then that first uh, data point is showing large uh, decreases the day after the very first session, and that is, that's, uh, remains low. So that may suggest that two sessions are unnecessary um, uh, to uh, get a, a very significant treatment effect. And this is just showing percentage, uh, showing clinical uh, significant responses and remission rates, uh, which you can see in, the, in that top uh, line, it's about 70% showing clinically significant responses. And toward the bottom, we have about 55% uh, are in remission out to 12 weeks. So the conclusions here are that a moderate and high dose of psilocybin when administered under these supportive conditions can produce substantial and enduring decreases in depressed mood. So this is uh, uh, resonant with the conclusions from the cancer work. Uh, depression was substantially decreased the day after the first session, suggesting a single dose may be adequate for therapeutic response. Uh, in no case did treatment exacerbate depression. And uh, not, I didn't show you the data, but there were two participants who had little or no therapeutic response. So not everybody responded, but that's a that's still a remarkably high percentage that did respond. And we're in the process of doing our longer term follow-up and uh, you know to anticipate uh, th those results continue to be really quite remarkable at uh, at 12 months. Although some individuals have gone back uh, to using classic SSRI antidepressants in the interim. Uh, but even among those, they would claim and attribute huge changes in quality of life due to the experience. So um, limitation to our study courses, we didn't have a placebo or pharmacologically active control condition. And you know this is just a, <laughs> a real uh, experimental puzzle across the board uh, about what the most appropriate comparison conditions are. Uh, and, um, and so there's no, there's no single best study to do. We need to do a series of studies. And FDA notably has given breakthrough therapy designation to two companies uh, initiating psilocybin for indications of either treatment resistant depression or major depressive disorder which could result in approval. This, this work with psilocybin is lagging uh, the MDMA work, which uh, looks like it'll be first over the finish line, hopefully, fingers crossed, uh, with respect to uh, medical approval. Okay, the, what about addiction treatment? So number one, why addiction? There was interesting work done in the 50s through 70s. Uh, particularly with LSD and alcoholism. Uh, we approached this, and this was uh, work by Matt Johnson in our group, uh, and decided we would start with cigarette smoking because we, we uh, felt, uh, we, we didn't, we actually didn't want, we wanted to avoid initially working with more difficult uh, uh, patients with deeper psychosocial problems. Um, and what we did is uh, used a cognitive behavior therapy approach for smoking cessation. We integrated that with our standard psilocybin preparation and support. In this case, we offered up to three psilocybin sessions starting with 20 milligrams per 70 kilogram on the target quit date. And then they had opportunities to go to two additional sessions of 30. Uh, mean age, this is 15 volunteers. So this is small open label pilot, Fif uh, 51 uh, years of age, uh, more male than female, 19 cigarettes per day on average, 31 years of smoking, mean previous quit attempts, six. 
And this really captures it in a nutshell. This is showing urinary codeine, which is a metabolite of, uh, of nicotine, a, a, a fairly long acting one, and showing uh, that in the first weeks of the study, uh, those levels, these are median levels, are high. You come to the uh, target quit date, which corresponds to the first psilocybin session, and uh, median is down to zero and remains low. Out to six months, we have 80% abstinence rate. And Matt published, our, uh, so yeah, he has, I think he's published this data. Uh, um, this was some point uh, uh, prevalence abstinence uh, rate out to 30 months, it's still at 60%. So that's, that's very promising. There's other work going on in the fields of addiction. Uh, so uh, Michael Bogenschutz at NYU and Peter Hendricks at University of Alabama, Bir Birmingham are looking at alcohol use and cocaine use uh, disorder respectively. We'll be initiating a study in, uh, in on uh, opiate dependence and, I, and there are a variety of other targets. So there, there'd be nothing in theory that would uh, prohibit this approach being germane to treatment of any disorder of self-control. And, um, and we also ran a cross-sectional survey study documenting naturalistic psychedelic use was followed in many cases by reduction or cessation of opiate cannabis and stimulant use. So uh, uh, backing up, um, uh, I've talked, I talked a bunch about the neurophysiological mechanisms that might be at play. And, uh, and now I just, I, I just want to th uh, think out loud about what kind of psychological or cognitive mechanisms might be at play for accounting for these kinds of effects. So number one is mystical experience, including this endured, enduring and authoritative and highly valued sense of connectedness. And, and I'll, I, I, what I'll show you in just a second is that mystical experience actually is a fairly good predictor of positive outcomes. But, but here's some others. So one, what I'm calling ontological shock that results in a profound shift in a sense of self and worldview that may result in a reconstruction of life story and a loosening of self-focused narrative. None of these are mutually exclusive. They're just different descriptive frameworks. There can be insight about self or relationships that may be experienced as memory or catharsis. And, and that, that certainly would be quite true uh, for MDMA and PTSD. Um, is a sense of increased self-efficacy or self-agency. Uh, we've shown increased in increases in the personality domain of openness, which is considered to be a fixed characteristic of individuals, yet uh, you know, one of these single experiences of the mystical type can produce enduring changes and, and uh, personality characteristics of openness. Then they're plugged into this is curiosity about the nature of mind or consciousness, uh, increased sense of mindfulness that emerges. And, and there's something else, this greater tolerance for or interest in benefiting from discomfort. So there's a different relationship people have to discomfort in their lives. Mystical experience. So um, just returning to this mystical experience scores. In this case, this was from our initial uh, study in healthy volunteers. What's shown on the left is that uh, mystical experience scores after a psilocybin session predicts, in this case, spiritual significant ratings at, uh, it was at one year or 14 months. And so there's a, there's something being captured by th this measure of mystical experience. And I would, would posit that it has to do with this connectedness and the authoritative truth value of that. 
that uh, uh, that results in enduring positive effects. And it's not just on the right hand side. It's not just the intensity of the psilocybin effect per se. So this isn't. This has something to do with qualitative features of the experience. And this is shown now across a variety of studies. So here's our cancer patients showing uh, anxiety and depression uh, uh, to be negatively correlated with uh, mystical experience questionnaires. Here's uh, depression uh, change scores from our uh, recent study in uh, major depressive disorder. Here's smoking craving. This is uh, work by Albert Garcia Romeo from our lab and, and Matt uh, showing that that is decreasing as a function of mystical experience score. Here's a model that we're currently playing with. This is Alan Davis's work. And it, ca it came out of some survey work, but it, it's fitting with what I think may be going on. And that, and that is, uh, this was a, a structural modeling um, uh, showing that acute mystical experience and acute insightful experiences feed into this construct of increases in psychological flexibility. And it's that increased psychological flexibility and, and having to do with the ability to tolerate suffering and, and being open to viewing the world in a different way. It's associated with marked decreases in depression and anxiety. And it's for that reason that we've gotten interested in uh, measuring these uh, insightful experiences. So uh, conclusion and implications. Uh, under the conditions of these studies, psilocybin occasion, discrete experiences have marked similarities to classic mystical and insightful type experiences. These experiences are associated with enduring positive trait changes in attitudes, moods, and behavior in both healthy and patient populations. The finding that psilocybin can occasion in most people studied these mystical and insightful experiences, virtually identical to those that occur naturally, suggests that such experiences are biologically normal. That is, we're we're wired to have these experiences. If you give psilocybin in the right conditions, almost everybody or most people have such experiences. Uh, and, and the implication of that is that now we can study these experiences. They're now amenable to systematic prospective scientific study in a way they haven't been historically because we didn't know how to a reliably occasion them. And, and so with that just becomes this kind of massive opportunity for, for research on all different levels of analysis, you know, in terms of biological psychiatry, how to factors such as personality, genetics, personal intention, effective likelihood, neuroscience, you know, we talked about that, what structural functional changes in brain, can account for acute and enduring effects. Behavioral sciences, what behaviors are changed after such experiences? What behavioral mechanisms account for such changes? Therapeutics, I mean, that's gonna, that's really gonna drive the potential funding in this area. Are there therapeutic benefits to this, uh, these experiences? And so um, our, our center has been tasked with going off in too many di different directions at once, it seems, uh, to explore therapeutic applications to different populations. And then finally, and, and, uh, and it, it feels quite important to me that the sense of altruism and pro-social dispositions that emerge from these experiences strike me as being a fundamental uh, importance. Um, in the in the sense that this sense of positivity, pro-social uh, sense of the interconnectedness of all people and things really leads to this impulse for mutual caretaking, kind of the, the recognition that we're all in this together at some really fundamental level. Uh, and 
that strikes me as really important for us to understand, for us to explore scientifically. This isn't about psychedelics. I mean, this is about the human condition, you know, and, and psychedelics might drop away as a model system. They may be seen as a crude way, but, you know, we need to understand those processes because they seem to me to underwrite the uh, ethical and moral traditions of cultures, you know, for thousands and thousands of years to, uh, to do, do to others as, as you would have them do to you. Uh, and so there's something very important to what I, my claim would be to the survival of our species to understand that uh, core implication of these experiences. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, we learned a lot. I think everyone is really processing, but it looks like we already have a question from, oh, Dr. Schiller. So I'm gonna ask her to come up. Uh, and everyone else, if you don't mind, just putting your questions in the Q&A chat. Um, hopefully we can get to them. And then tonight at 5.30, just a reminder, we'll also be having a small group discussion for whoever wants to join. Um, so we welcome you there. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much. It was really fascinating. Uh, I have two questions, if it's okay. One is about the mystical experience. Uh, I was wondering if it could be related to psychological, so, sorry, physiological changes in bodily sensations, especially diminished perception of the bodily borders. And the second question is more general. Uh, since there are several psychedelic uh, candidates, how would a therapist go about deciding which one is appropriate for which patient or for each patient or each condition? Well, let's see. So uh, let's see, to answer the first question, um, uh, we, we don't know. I mean, we don't know what, what the factors are that contribute to this so-called mystical experience. So, the Imperial Group has really focused on ego dissolution as, as a core feature of, of the uh, experience that they think is fundamental. You know, but that's actually very similar to our questionnaire that measures uh, a sense of unity, a sense of interconnectedness, uh, a sense that all, all is one. Just ego dissolution is, uh, falls short in that you can have a very significant ego dissolution uh, uh, under conditions where you can produce just ho horrible trips. I mean, the classic bad trip uh, can, that's exactly what people are fighting against is this sense of, uh, of dissolving. How much of that is somatically based? You know, and that, I think that's your question. What, how much can we, you know, account for somatics. How much of that is somatic and psychological? I, I don't know. I mean, our, our model is, is uh, giving uh, fairly high doses of psilocybin, doses higher than would be commonly used recreationally, where, <laughs> where there's good reason to have people lay down on the couch. Uh, um, and, and so we have not done much to intrude on those experiences by measuring physiological effects other than blood pressure uh, and heart rate. There have been other, other studies that, that um, have done so, but anyway. Um, with respect to what compounds to use, I mean, we're just at the very beginning of this exciting work in this field. I mean, so, you know, right now the, the two lead candidate compounds, uh, well, we have psilocybin is the classic psychedelic, and then MDMA, which is not a classic psychedelic, but it's, it has features like that. You know, there are, um, there are literally thousands of candidates, uh, structures uh, that could function as serotonin 2A agonists that very well may have a constellation of effects uh, similar to, but not identical to uh, psilocybin. And 
uh, and with the development of the the uh, modeling of the receptor pocket and the amount of money that's going into this whole area of research. I mean, we're gonna see new compounds coming out all the time. Right now, I mean, I, what, I could, what I could say, although good double blind studies haven't been done, is that psilocybin still remains very different than LSD, which remains very different than mescaline which is very different than DMT, all of which are just said to be classic hallucinogens. So my guess would be that there's, <laughs> there's a lot to be discovered. We've just kind of wandered into this area. Psilocybin has uh, some nice features in terms of its time course and its uh, duration of activity. Um, and, and it's the ease with which we can manage it uh, clinically. But we're just at the infancy of this. Yeah. Thanks very much. Thank you. I think we have Leah next. Hi, thanks so much for speaking. Um, my question has to do with what value you see in using animal models to study the mechanistic underpinnings of psychedelic assisted psychotherapy. And I think particularly I'm interested in how much insight do you think we can learn if mystical experience remains such an important part of psychedelic psychotherapy experience? Yeah, well, thanks. Um, so uh, uh, we wrote a commentary uh, that was uh, published uh, uh, late last year on uh, uh, with the thesis that the subjective effects are uh, central part of the sustained therapeutic effects. But, but um, we wrote that in, uh, uh, along with David Olson from UC Davis, who took the contrarian position because he's doing all the, uh, uh, the neurogenesis uh, uh, and neuroplasticity work. He took the contrary position uh, that subjective effects are irrelevant. Uh, uh, he didn't state it quite that strongly. But you know, that's, that's it. Uh, that's at play. Uh, and, um, and we don't know, we don't know the answer, answer to that. I think both have to be at, at work uh, here. And, and it's a question of what, in my mind, kind of what is percentage of, of uh, change. But I think animal, I mean, I, I spent half my career uh, working with uh, baboons and rats and behavioral pharmacology, I, you know, I think an animal research has uh, has plenty to contribute to this area. But to the extent that that there's some fundamental shift in meaning making that comes out of these experiences at a experiential level, you know, call it insight or mystical experience. And that that's, that's actually accounting for a reprogramming of the narrative structure of how someone holds themselves in the world. It's, it seems quite improbable we're going to develop very adequate animal models to, to get to that feature. And, and I, I would have to say, I, I have a bias. On <laughs> I'm really interested in the nature of the phenomenology of the human experience, because it's, <laughs> it's this experience in which we all live. This is what we, this is actually what we know. It's the only thing we know. We, all we know is, <laughs> is that we awaken in, uh, in the morning and that we're aware of something. We're aware that we're aware. And I can know that of myself. I can't know that of you. This is the human condition in, in its essence. What's more interesting than that? But, but having said that, there's plenty that we can contribute with animal research. Thank you so much. Um, I think we have Jacob next. Hi, Dr. Griffiths. That was uh, so fascinating and interesting. Um, I was wondering if you could speak on the patient's ability to complete additional tasks that might include other physiological outcomes, including EEG, and how that might... Uh, affect the patient's mystical experience um, in itself. Yeah. Um, it's a, a, a course of chronic concern and debate within our own laboratory. Uh, 
so so yeah we have uh and uh, we're proposing and conducting studies that uh are are doing a lot more uh, eg work we've done uh we've done mri work uh with acute effects the way we have managed that is to bring the dose of psychedelic way down so uh the people that we've scanned under psilocybin uh we have generally given 10 milligrams per 70 kilogram, which is a third of the dose of our, our highest dose. I think EEG would be, um, would be much more amenable uh, uh, to looking at, at higher doses. But, you know, there can emerge, if you get really high doses, there really can emerge a confusional element where, where people lose all grounding. And then, yeah, and you're going to have them ripping off electrodes, and you're going to have, just have a mess on your hands. But I, so I think that uh, I, th I think it's very important to query uh, uh, brain during these kinds of things. So I think we just need to think creatively about how to do that. And I don't, and I suspect that would be much less of a problem with MDMA. Thank you. I think we only have time for one more question. I think Rachel actually had a really good question that would be great to uh, hear about. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, that was a fabulous talk. We really appreciate it. I I'm wondering why it is, um, wh wh why does it make it scientists so uncomfortable to study things like the mystical experience? And I mean, maybe it was a marketing error. Um, what, what do you think is analogous that would be more comforting or analogous to study. I know what you're talking about, but I also know that when you begin to talk that way in these kinds of academic communities, you see a little bit of anxiety. And what do you think that's about? Let's see, well, on, let's see, on multiple levels. Um, uh, you know, psychiatry is a field that's been deeply suspicious of uh, religion and and spirituality, and uh, or at least at least Hopkins psychiatry has. I don't know what what it's like in in, in Mount Sinai, but there's also this kind of uh, evoking of uh, supernatural, uh, you know, ideas and entities, uh, you know, and there's nothing in our mystical experience questionnaire that would suggest that, but, uh, that, but that's so close akin that that's what people think that we're, we may be implying. Uh, and I'm, uh, depending on what hat I'm wearing, I'm, uh, I'm either, yeah, I either deny that or I'm agnostic, agnostic to it, or I'm open to it as a, a possibility. I'm just deep, I'm deeply curious about all all possibilities because because I don't think we really understand what's going on <laughs> here at the broadest sense. But but you know within the bounds and rules of science, we have to deal with third person perspectives, and we can't be hypothesizing magic mechanisms that you know aren't testable. So that's where that suspicion comes from. So I was actually asked yesterday when I gave a talk. Um, whether psilocybin can make somebody who's an atheist religious and believe in God. So this is really out there in terms of how people are responding to and interpreting the work. Um, I did say I would ask you that question since I wasn't an expert. <laughs> well, we've actually done several uh, survey studies and the answer is that uh, a significant portion of people who claim to identify as atheists prior to a, you know, a huge experience, no longer do so afterwards. Now, that doesn't mean that they all of a sudden believe that Christ is the one and only savior, right? Uh, I, I take that to mean uh, that going in, that they assumed that there was no possibility that anything of the sort that we could possibly call God exists. And they were certain of that in their own mind. 
these experiences are so enormous and so humbling about what it is that we don't understand about the very nature of this. And that has to do with this noetic quality of, of, of uh, feeling like you're in the presence of an ultimate reality. And, there, and it's beyond words. I mean, that's one of the characteristics. It's beyond words. And so for some people, they're saying, well, gee, that sounds like what people must be calling God because I, I can't, I can't, you know, I don't know. Um, so yeah, I, I think people are less likely to be atheists. That doesn't mean that they're going to be conventional religious believers and that they're going to believe in uh, uh, any dogmatic uh, uh, religious uh, theories. I think it's just they're open to the mystery of what they don't know. And, and where I sit, that's, that's humbling, uh, you know, but it's also incredibly empowering. I mean, when, when we really allow ourselves to recognize that we don't get what's going on here, that, uh, and, and then what emerges from that? And for me, it's this, uh, it's this astonishment, number one, that this this whole thing is happening. I mean that you know we wouldn't have to be these conscious aware beings, right? The astonishment, and then the incredible gratitude. I mean, why, why, why? Me? How did I? What you know? This is this is something to be celebrated, and and it's uh, overpowering, you know. And then scientifically, because that's where my train is. Boy, let's try to figure this out. You know, we have tools. To do this, let's do let's do our best. Yeah. Fascinating to think about going in this direction. Thank you so much. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you. I wish we didn't have to say goodbye, but thank you so much for spending some time with us today. My pleasure. Thanks a lot for having me. Okay. Congratulations on your new center. I expect great things coming out of Mount Sinai. And, and thanks to the audience and, and your participation and your questions. And I'm sure we'll have you back because <laughs> there's so much more to talk about. <laughs> so we'll definitely ask. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Bye-bye.